We're now going to shift gears a bit and get a status update on the two largest federal programs that impact retirement security, Social Security and Medicare. Those programs are supposed to have two public trustees to oversee their finances, but because of political gridlock, the positions have remained vacant for three years. This is, partly con this is particularly concerning right now, given the precarious state of their finances. Thanks in part to the Peterson Foundation, we at the Bipartisan Policy Center have had the privilege over the last couple of years to help fill that void by working with Chuck Blahouse and Bob Reischauer, the two most recent public trustees, to continue their objective analysis of Social Security and Medicare. Their newly released report is on the front table and I'd encourage you to grab a copy. Leading them in conversation this afternoon is Mark Goldwine, who is Senior Vice President and Senior Policy Director for the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget which is one of uh, Funding Our Future's campaign partners, where he is one of the foremost authorities on a wide array of topics related to fiscal policy and the federal budget, particularly for today's purposes, Social Security and Medicare. You can tell how passionate Mark is about these programs because he has taken to including a photo of his one-year-old daughter, Juliana, in PowerPoint presentations where he makes the case for why we need to, to address them. Mark doesn't have a PowerPoint today, but he's going to lead us in a really interesting conversation with the two most recent public trustees. So with that, Mark. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here today. And uh, uh, I'm certainly excited to be here, and especially excited to be on the ninth floor of the Hart Building, which is sort of the Capitol Hill equivalent of the 13th story of somewhere outside of Washington, DC. I bet <laughs> most people didn't even know it, it, it existed. Uh, you heard a little bit about personal retirement security, but what we're going to talk about here a little bit is not just the two largest federal programs for retirement security, but the two largest programs in the entire federal government, which also happen to be, for many folks, uh, their two largest sources of income in retirement. Unfortunately, both of these programs are headed towards insolvency, uh, at which point neither will be able to pay 100% benefits and instead, under current law, will be cut down to whatever revenue is, is brought in. Uh, just a, a little bit of plug for my organization. I, I am the senior vice president for a group called the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget. And if you go to our website, crfb.org, we have an interactive tool that really hits home how much Social Security insolvency could affect you individually. Uh, you basically enter your birth year, and it tells you when the trust fund is, is supposed to run out and how much you stand to lose, assuming average income, average life expectancy. Um, if I plug in 1995, someone that's born in 1995, sort of a middle-aged millennial, uh, Social Security would be depleted by their 39th birthday, and they'd lose about $180,000 of lifetime income in today's dollars. If I, if I plug in my one-year-old daughter, Juliana, as I often do on, on Slide Deck, Social Security will be out by the time she turns 17, and she could lose $260,000. Uh, I was nice enough not to plug in your birth dates uh, <laughs> for, for this tool, but I'm very, very excited to have um, really two of, two of my heroes and two foremost experts on, the, on Social Security Medicare. Uh, Chuck Blahaus and Bob Reischauer here. Uh, Chuck Blahaus is the senior research strategist at the Mercatus Center, um, and previously he was uh, the deputy director of the NEC National Economic Council for President Bush and ran the 2001 bipartisan uh, commission to strengthen Social Security. Bob Reischauer is a distinguished fellow at the Urban Institute, where he previously served as as president. Prior to that, he was director, the second director of the Congressional Budget Office, uh, and before that at Brookings. Both Chuck and Bob have written extensively on Social Security and Medicare. Both served recent, most recently as the public trustees uh, of the Social Security and Medicare programs. Both also served on the Bipartisan Policy Center's Retirement Security Commission. And now, um, I believe you both are part of uh, a, a former trustees project that has generously been funded by the Peter G. Peterson Foundation. Uh, so I'd love at this point to, to really open up into a discussion of the future and. Um, Social Security and Medicare, and uh, Chuck, let's start with you. Can you give us a brief overview of the health of the Social Security program uh, and why it matters for people that are just starting to save for retirement today? First, I need to make sure my microphone is working. Is it? Yes. Oh, wow. Miracle of miracles. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm also very pleased to be up here with, with Mark and Bob, uh, uh, really um, two extremely illustrious uh, and accomplished uh, experts on these issues. So uh, I think this is going to be a great panel. Uh, unfortunately, unlike the last panel, I think all I will have will be gloom and doom. So I'm glad there was a little bit of uh, optimism injected into the last one. Uh, let me just preface my 
remarks by uh, saying a little bit about what the trust funds are and why they matter and what the public trustees do in their jobs as uh, public trustees. Social Security has uh, two trust funds. Uh, one is the so-called Old Age and Survivors Insurance Trust Fund. That's what we think of basically as the retirement portion of Social Security. And there's also a Disability Insurance Trust Fund. And under law, all of the benefits that Social Security pays must be paid from uh, the resources of these trust funds. So all of you who are currently working are paying payroll taxes uh, into these trust funds. Uh, and every year, the annual trustees reports uh, project going forward whether uh, the uh, trust funds will have sufficient resources to be able to meet their full benefit schedules. And for several years, uh, the answer has been no. And, and each year, that imbalance has been getting somewhat worse. Now, there is sometimes a temptation, I think, to dismiss the trust funds as mere accounting devices. And in a certain sense, they are mere accounting devices. They're certainly uh, just ways of tracking particular operations within the federal government's larger budget. Uh, but I would uh, argue to all of you that they, they very much matter, and they very much matter for your own retirement planning, because these trust funds are basically what distinguish Social Security and Medicare from other forms of federal benefit programs. Uh, they are the things that basically provide uh, some stability and predictability to the benefits that are paid. If you look at most other federal programs, whether we're talking about food stamps or EITC or various so-called welfare programs or what have you, there's, there's almost an annual renegotiation as to who should be eligible for them and what benefits should they get and should there be a means test and, and all the rest. Social Security and Medicare are, are much less frequently subject to that. And, and I would argue that the reason for that is because of this trust fund financing mechanism, uh, because the, the, the programs are deemed to be spending revenues that were allocated for the purpose of financing those benefits, and because, at least in the aggregate, participants are uh, considered to have earned or contributed to or receive their benefits, uh, that they tend to be uh, less subject to annual political renegotiation, which means that if you're trying to plan your retirement, uh, that's a very important feature. Uh, it means you, at least if the programs continue the way they've been structured historically, you would be able to count on a, a far higher level of predictability in those benefits than if you were counting on food stamps or something like that. And, and that's very important. Now, I'm not going to try to convince all of you that you should care about this a whole lot now. Uh, and the reason I'm not going to try to do that is because eventually you're going to care about it, no matter what I say up here. Uh, we all go through the same life cycle. In the 20s, as was said earlier, everyone says, oh, well, that's far away. That program's not going to be there for me, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't really matter. And um, there's, a, there's a heavy discounting of what these programs are going to mean for your life. Uh, when you're 60, you don't feel that way anymore. Everyone goes through that process. So it really doesn't matter what someone on a panel says, so I won't try. But uh, what I would try to convince you of is that since you are going to start caring anyway at some point, uh, I would like to convince you you should do it earlier rather than later. Because if you don't, and if uh, action to safeguard the finances of these programs doesn't happen soon, uh, you're going to lose a lot of money for reasons that Mark indicated. Now, uh, in answer to Mark's questions about how the financial outlook looks for Social Security, uh, it's not very good. Uh, there's an actuarial imbalance of 2.84% of all worker taxable wages going forward over the next 75 years. That might sound small, but it isn't. Uh, that's about 21% uh, of all the program's projected revenues. It's about 17% of all the program's projected costs. Uh, and what that means is that you have to make already today, if you were to have action today, extremely large adjustments in order to bring the program back into a condition where it can pay full scheduled benefits. Uh, historically, lawmakers have not wanted to just cut benefits across the board. They haven't wanted to cut benefits for people already in retirement. Uh, so if you ask the question, uh, how big would the cuts have to be if we were going to have only prospective changes in, uh, in the benefit structure going forward, and the answer there would be about 21%. Uh, and that's starting immediately next year without a phase in. So these are very, very substantial um, uh, shortfalls. Um, very important point I would make is that although the finances of the trust funds are often discussed, unfortunately, in a lot of press reporting, in terms of their scheduled depletion dates, which on the disability side is 2032 and on the old age and survivor side is 2034, 
I would urge you not to pay any attention to the depletion dates because they really don't matter that much. Uh, by the time those dates roll around, we are so far past the point of no return, there's no practical likelihood that you would be able to get uh, sufficiently strong legislative action to restore the programs to balance. So the, the meaningful question is not when do the trust funds run out, but how soon do we have to act if we're going to have even a remote chance of bringing the programs back into uh, balance? And the answer to that is that that window of opportunity is closing already. Uh, the shortfall that I just described is already substantially larger. It's about twice as large if you use the same actuarial methodology as the shortfall that was closed in the landmark 1983 reforms. Those 1983 reforms occurred on the brink of disaster. Uh, the checks were literally months away from not going out. Those reforms almost didn't happen. Uh, there was a, a lobbying push by AARP to stop them from happening, and both parties had to lock hands and jump off the cliff together and, and make it occur, and it was a very close run thing. In order to save the program then, they had to delay COLAs by six months. They had to expose benefits to taxation for the first time. They had to bring all federal employees into the system and all their payroll taxes, their new payroll taxes. Obviously, we don't have that option anymore because you're already paying them. They had to raise the retirement age. They had to accelerate a previously scheduled payroll tax increase. Uh, and already, if we were to try to act today, we would have to inflict uh, changes upon taxpayers and beneficiaries that are about twice as large today as they were then. Um, if we wait until the point uh, that trust funds are running out, we're going to we will be looking at changes that are about three or four times as severe as they were then. And another little uh, data point: even if you completely cut off benefits for all those newly eligible in the early 2030s, you still would not be able to bring the system back into actuarial balance. So we're in uncharted waters, uh, and we we simply cannot wait that long to fix the system. If we wait too much longer, we're not going to be able to balance the system within its historical financing structure. And then you would have to do something else to finance Social Security. It would have to be financed, perhaps subsidized from the general fund, uh, and the program would have to compete each year for funding with other components of the general fund, and it would be subject to much, much greater variability and changeability, and, and its reliability as a retirement income mechanism would be uh, much less. Now, having depressed everyone with that, I want to tell you that we've known all this for a long while, uh, and this year it got even worse. Uh, the, the qualitative long-term picture in Social Security really didn't change much this year. But the short-term picture actually took yet another turn for the worse. Uh, there were some adverse developments with respect to uh, payroll tax collections and the, and the size of the payroll tax base uh, going forward in the next few years. It, it was really it was a retroactive, retrospective data revision that uh, changed the outlook. So we actually are starting this year to draw down the combined Social Security trust funds. That's not a significant event in and of itself. Uh, beneficiaries won't feel that. Taxpayers won't immediately feel that. But, but the reason it's bad is that it's happening four years faster than uh, we thought it was going to happen in last year's report. And, and a, a, an adverse change of that size and rapidity is very unusual. Uh, and so that's problematic. So as bad as everything uh, looked last year, it looks that much worse this year. And maybe I should stop before everyone starts heading for the windows over there. And I'll turn it over to Bob. I think that was a great, extremely depressing overview, and I'm really hoping that um, Bob can give us some optimism on the question of Medicare's finances and what it means for, for millennials. Anybody who knows me realizes that's a false hope. Uh, if I can't uh, outdo uh, Chuck in dismal prognostications, I haven't earned my money. Uh, let me just start by saying uh, it's lucky Mark didn't uh, plug in my birth date uh, because I probably wouldn't escape this room alive. Uh, notwithstanding my youthful appearance, uh, I'm on the exit ramp of life here. And uh, as such, I've been a great beneficiary of Social Security and Medicare. And by the time our legislators get around to passing the kinds of uh, legislation that's needed to put these programs back on path, um, I probably won't be affected very much. Anyway, uh, let me uh, start because Medicare is a much more complicated program than uh, Social Security uh, with uh, a mixture of sort of fact, what the program is, and uh, what the prognostication is for the future. and how it will affect uh, those of you who aren't gray-haired uh, in this room. Uh, Medicare has two components, the first of which is called hospital insurance, or HI, and uh, it pays for 
hospitals, some of home health, uh, SNF hospice. Uh, and it operates very much like uh, the Social Security system does in that uh, benefits can only be paid out of a trust fund. Trust fund is financed uh, by and large from payroll taxes, which all of us pay on earnings, uh, wages, not income. Uh, unlike Social Security, there is no cap on the uh, earnings, which is subject to the tax. It's every penny uh, you earn uh, is subject uh, to the tax. Like Social Security, it also uh, has costs that are exceeding uh, its income, its non-interest income, and as a result, its assets have been uh, or are at this point uh, being depleted. Uh, and the uh, date at which uh, the trust fund will be empty will be uh, 2026, eight short years from now, uh, which given our uh, legislature's um, proclivity to uh, procrastinate uh, is really a blink of the eyes. Um, when uh, it is depleted, like Social Security, benefits can only uh, be paid uh, according to how much income is coming into the trust fund uh, because the trust fund has no legal authority to borrow. If we wanted to close the gap uh, between uh, uh, spending and uh, income over the long run, uh, we would have to increase payroll tax from 2.9% to 3.72% or reduce spending in 2026 20, uh, by 17%. Since uh, Medicare payments to providers, HI payments to providers, are well below those paid by uh, private insurance, and are below what uh, providers claim is their average cost of producing uh, these services, uh, and because we haven't been particularly successful about uh, designing policies that can reduce the growth of spending in significant ways, um, it is highly likely, uh, in my opinion, that uh, most of the solution to this is going to be in the form of higher uh, payroll taxes. And uh, for all of us in the room, uh, that means we have less disposable income from which to uh, devote to retirement savings and other uh, good things. Uh, so um, if you're going to save for retirement, do it now uh, before these added taxes come on board, which, as I said, eight years from now is not a long time. Uh, so uh, that's where we are. Second component of Medicare is something called the Supplemental Medical Insurance Program, SMI, which covers physician and outpatient uh, uh, fees uh, and institutional charges and some home health and prescription drugs. Uh, this is a voluntary program, unlike HI. HI, because you pay ta payroll taxes your whole life, you are automatically uh, entitled to benefits if you d have done this for long enough to be eligible for Social Security benefits. Um, SMI is voluntary, meaning you have to sign up. Virtually everybody does, except people in this room uh, who, uh, as I will explain a little later, um, often opt to stay in the federal employee's health benefit plan so they don't have to sign up for Part B because Part B uh, costs a significant amount. And for people with higher incomes, you pay a supplemental premium that makes it uh, not uh, a particularly good deal. Um, now, SMI, this second part, Part B, um, has a trust fund, has two trust funds. Uh, but there's no danger that these will run out of money. Uh, and the reason why is these trust funds aren't uh, supported by payroll tax. They are supported by and large, 72% uh, by general revenue transfers and about 24% by premiums that participants pay or are paid on behalf of low-income uh, participants. Um, and 
the law says that we transfer this money from the general fund to these trust funds and we raise premiums sufficiently each year automatically to cover the costs that are expected from these programs. So this is sort of on automatic pilot over here and you think, well, you know, that's okay. How can that be a problem? Uh, well, it's a problem in two senses. Uh, one is that uh, as long as costs are rising in this program, which is over half of the total Medicare bill, faster than GDP or incomes, uh, the premiums that all participants end up having to pay go up at a faster rate than their incomes are. So uh, back to how much you should stash away, um, stash away more than uh, you were asked to stash away because your premiums here are going to be rising a whole lot faster than whatever you expect uh, your income to be. And they're not uh, inconsequential at this point. Uh, Part B premium uh, is 1600 roughly a year for an individual, twice that for a couple, so you're talking at over uh, $3,000 a year uh, for Part B. Uh, for uh, the drug benefit, it's something in the order of four to $500 a year, $1,000 if you're a couple. So, you know, we're talking about, for many people, maybe not at your income level, this is a big chunk of your retirement income, given how modest total uh, retirement incomes are and what the projections are for the future. But rising premiums aren't the whole story uh, that you're going to face because Medicare isn't a gold-plated program. And you, uh, who are in the federal system particularly, are used to a gold-plated uh, program. Uh, it imposes pretty high deductibles, coinsurance, limits on uh, the length of services you can provide, like how many days you can stay in the hospital, how many days you can get a skilled nursing facility benefit. Uh, and unlike any other qualified health plan in America today, ACA qualified health plan, there is no catastrophic cap. Uh, so you are subject to deductibles and coinsurance up through the roof. Uh, and that's the reason why vast majority of people who are in Medicare try and seek some other supplemental insurance uh, to cover them from the costs that Medicare uh, doesn't cover. Um, and uh, those programs are not cheap. The average Medicare policy right now costs 2,200 uh, bucks a year, about 4,400 for the couple. Uh, so, you know, I've been adding up here uh, that, you know, the average elderly person uh, is really going to have to shell out a very significant amount of money in retirement uh, and one that is going up at a very rapid rate uh, to provide adequate uh, health insurance uh, in the future. Now, um, if I haven't beaten Chuck at this point, uh, I will uh, add to the bad news uh, because as uh, SMI costs grow faster than GDP, as they are projected to do, uh, they will absorb an ever-increasing chunk of the nation's income. And to the extent that we continue to fund a rapidly growing program like this, we're going to have to raise regular income taxes to make those general fund transfers uh, or cut other general fund supported programs, defense, poverty programs, whatever. And so no matter what you care about, uh, you know, uh, in the way of domestic or international spending, it's going to be affected if we don't uh, sort of get our hands around uh, the growth of SMI uh, programs. Now, just a concluding word for you folks uh, who are federal employees and likely to stay there until you retire and not sign up for Part B Medicare. I didn't mention that there's a supplemental income-related premium uh, that can triple the premium costs that I uh, have uh, uh, outlined for you. Uh, but many federal workers uh, stay on the federal employee plan because it's a good plan, uh, beats many of the supplemental uh, Medicare programs that are, that are uh, out there, and it absolves you 
from uh, the income-related supplemental premiums. My guess is that won't last 10 years. Uh, so those of you who are pre-gray hair uh, status, if you're counting on uh, you know, escaping these income-related premium, uh, you know, don't count on it. Uh, you're going to get hit with it uh, even as members of the federal employee plan. Bottom line, I see people flashing signs at me that <laughs> at my age I can't read because my eyesight is so terrible um, that uh, because of what's happening in Medicare, you're going to have less money as uh, time goes on uh, to devote to retirement. So start doing it now, big time, and you'll be absolved from doing as much uh, as you might have planned later on. And uh, medical costs, because of new technologies, are going to grow much faster, I think, than we uh, have any appreciation for. And Medicare is going to be a lot less generous a program, and that's not going to absolve you from costs, because costs will be more, generosity will be less, the amount you pay for supplemental insurance will be even more. So that's it. You know, what I appreciate about this, even the good news about that technological growth is also bad news uh, for all of us. I really hope the next panel is a little, uh, a little more positive and um, cheers people up for the rest of the day. But please do uh, join me in thanking Chuck and Bob for that very helpful discussion. So